This is Sunday Morning Together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. And good morning, Phil Edwards here. Great to have you with us on this Sunday Morning Together. And my big challenge this morning is to pronounce my guest's, my co-host's surname correctly. Now I can say uh, she is the youth pastor at City Life Church in Melbourne. That much I can pronounce. And it's Shelley... Let Gamut. Did I get it right? I'm going to give you points for that. Oh. I think that was pretty good. Um, lots of different people say it a different way, so I think that's that's creative and that's great. I think I'll just oh. call you Pastor <laughs> Shelley for the rest of the morning. Good, good, good morning to you. It's great <laughs> to have you, you. part of uh, Sunday Morning Together. Thank you. It's a privilege and an honour to be here with you today. Now, you're a special breed, youth pastors. <laughs> you know, some, some might say you've got to have... Uh, Special qualification for uh, pain threshold, maybe? What? Why do you do it? <laughs> it's a good question because I've seen it evolve so much in the last 20 years. Um, sometimes I think bring us back to the 90s um, because 2024, there's so much compliance. You just can't do the crazy games and the uh, big high energy things as much anymore because there's so much insurance. But I love seeing young people and the next generations just encounter God. There is nothing more incredible uh, than that. And so it's energizing and it keeps you young. Yeah. So how long have you been doing it, Shelley? I have been in youth ministry uh, as a vocation, so in, as a job, uh, since 2006. Okay. So well, a few nearly, years. Yeah, nearly 20 years now, 18, 18 years. Yeah. What do you reckon, yeah. what's been the, the big lesson for you? Because I can imagine you do something like that for the first time. You're all gung-ho and you know it all, <laughs> but then you figure out you actually don't know it all. <laughs> as you oh, look, no. As yeah. you look back, what have you learned? Definitely. If you get to a place where you think you've nailed it or you know it all, you are definitely fooling yourself. Um, every, ministry is a vocation. Um, every day brings a new challenge and you're dealing with people. So every single person is different. Every situation is different and culture changes and shifts really quickly as well. And so once you think you know culture, um, I, I did a lot of research into Gen Z um, and now high schoolers, are, they're Gen Alpha as well. So mm. half of them are Gen Alpha. Mm. So I'm like, well, there goes five years of study. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so you always have to be learning and and humble and um, just on your feet, I think. Yeah, like a lot of things in life, I suspect. What don't we know about you, Shelley? What could give us a little insight into into what your world is? Oh, my world! Every every day is different. Um, I'm pushing th- um, forty. I'm forty at the start of next year. Um, I do look like not probably 40, and because I dre- also dress young. Um, but something that people don't know about me, I was diagnosed with ADHD about really? two or three years ago. And um, that was something that obviously I've had my whole life, um, but only a recent diagnosis. Um, and I feel like that keeps me again on my toes, but it's been an incredible journey, um, especially because I work with so many different families and so many different young people um, who are actually um, – um, walk in this journey of neurodiversity mm. and also to be diagnosed myself has been like quite a um quite an interesting road but very very fulfilling and um I feel like there's been deeper connections with people um as we're bonded over this as well so deeper understanding of young people today um but also um, um helping families as well yeah. there's there's nothing like experiencing something for yourself to build yeah. empathy for other people that are going through whatever it might be but i imagine something like that you know you getting to that point of diagnosis i've heard people say it's almost this aha moment i realize why it is I experience this, I think this way or I behave this way or so on. Has that been the, the case for you? Absolutely, because it's not like um, all of a sudden three years ago I got ADHD. It's something that I have always um, had. And so being able to articulate and being able to uh, um, um, understand and, and have a grasp on, I feel like information helps you to be able to um, navigate and to be, be able to put language to what you're experiencing, um, but also helps you be able to put uh, different things in place, maybe to be able to help you um, and to be able to put some uh, scaffolding around. So it's been really empowering uh, for me and um, being able to understand yourself. Look, if we, if we want to become more like Jesus, you know what I mean? We, we want to be the best that we can. And sometimes there are things that you know, do stop us. But I think the first uh, step to becoming more like Jesus is being self-aware and yeah. going, hey, 
if I'm self-aware and I know some of the things that may be weaknesses or, or strengths, I'm able to then use that, leverage that um, to be able to become more like Jesus um, mm. and, and be a better version of myself for everybody. And in that self-awareness, we can often focus on the weaknesses. But when we focus in on the things that God has given us, the gifts we have, the strengths that he's given us and, and work to really be in that sweet spot, yeah, that's when our lives can change pretty dramatically too, don't you think? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. And I know sometimes people think um, that neurodiversity uh, is, a, is a weakness, but to be honest with you, I actually see it as a strength. I've been on a massive journey with this and some people are like, oh, I can pray for you. And I'm like, please do not pray that off because that is my superpower. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what, what about, I mean, somebody, perhaps parents, they've got kids that are dealing with this. Yeah. Maybe there's people dealing with it themselves. What encouragement mm-hmm. do you give to them You know, from your journey? What have you learned? Yeah, I think it, it's about every every single person would express it a little bit differently. I'm hyperactive, and so understanding what uh, your ADHD, I guess, symptoms or, or how it how it comes out, um, and then being able to put things in place that can help you with your daily routines or whatever, but also being able to harness what you are good at. So for me, being hyperactive active, um, I can read really fast, or I can, sorry, listen on double speed. I can um, multitask like no one's business. Um, But then I also can't sleep. So it's going, all right, let's put some things in place for those sort of things. Um, So I think it's empowering to be able to understand yourself and then be able to have tools to be able to self-regulate and to be able to um, navigate life. But it's so empowering when you have those tools and that understanding. So I would um, encourage them to keep going um, um, and see it as a strength. Um, If you have a diagnosis, you have a, um, like a, a, like a, a, a an instruction manual, and so it's really it's so much easier. Yeah. yeah, this is Sunday morning together, and very shortly we're going to take communion together. Pastor Shelley gets to lead us in that real soon. But just personally, how do you prepare yourself toward communion, Shelley? That's a good question. I think for myself, if I'm um, leading communion, that's very different. That that takes sometimes even a week of me thinking about what to say. But in terms of just coming to communion, um, I really just, it's an amazing opportunity to focus my attention back on Jesus and making Jesus and his sacrifice the main thing um, and just, you know, really preparing my heart to say, hey, strip everything else back and just focus on on, on Jesus' sacrifice just in this in this um, moment and season. Yeah. Mm. Well, we get the opportunity to do that together in just a little while. So well, now's a good time. If you can, prepare some elements, uh, some bread and a cup to take part in communion together. We'll do that very soon. Sunday morning together. Across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. Well, today I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and it's verses 23 to 26. And this is the NIV. And Paul writes, For I have received from the Lord what I also pass to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And as we gather for communion today, we we are participating in something sacred and so profound. And this simple act of eating the bread and drinking from the cup is so much more than just a ritual. It's a powerful reminder of the most significant event in human history, the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. When we take communion, we are remembering that Jesus gave his life for us. He took our place, bearing the weight of our sins on the cross so that we could be forgiven and restored into right relationship with God. The bread represents his body, which was broken for us. The cup represents his blood, which was poured out as a sign of the new covenant, a new promise from God. And through Jesus' death and resurrection, we are no longer bound by sin, but we are made new in him. And when we take these elements, we do so in remembrance of of his incredible sacrifice. And we reflect on the love that drove Jesus to the cross and the grace that continues to transform us today. But as we participate in communion, we are not only just looking backwards. Paul, the apostle, tells us that whenever you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death 
until he comes. Communion is not just about remembering the past, but it's also a declaration of hope for the future. We proclaim that Jesus, who died and rose again, is coming back. And this is where we find such a deep sense of hope. No matter what circumstances we are facing today, no matter what struggles, pain or uncertainty in our lives, we can hold on to the promise that Jesus will return. The return of Jesus is the fulfillment of all that he has promised. A day when he will wipe every tear, heal every wound and make all things new. And this is the hope that we cling to as we face the challenges of life. Sometimes it seems uh, it's easy to feel overwhelmed by the difficulties we encounter, whether in our personal life or the world around us. But communion is a reminder that our hope is not in temporary things of this world, but in the eternal promises of God. Jesus will come again and his kingdom will be fully realized. But until that day, we live in the tension of remembering what he has done for us, but also looking forward to what he will do. His return is not just a distant uh, event to anticipate, it's the promise that sustains us now. It reminds us that even when life feels like it's falling apart, God is still faithful. His plans for us are still good. So today as we take the bread and we drink from the cup, let us not only remember the sacrifice of Jesus, but also hold on to the hope of his return. Let us trust that he has Um, He is with us. He is present with us in every season, whether we're walking through times of blessing or enduring really hard times of suffering. Let us proclaim with our hearts and our lives that Jesus is coming again, bringing with him the fullness of his peace, his justice, and his love. So let's eat together. Let's drink together. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you sent your only son to die in our place that we may have relationship with you. We thank you so much for this sacrifice of love and we thank you so much for the hope that you give us for the future. We thank you so much for your presence that dwells amongst us and may we feel your peace that transcends all understanding and may you comfort us no matter what season uh, we are in. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday morning together. Across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. Thank you so much, Shelley, for leading us through communion. And you kind of stuck to the basics there of the scriptures. And I love that. I mean, sometimes we think we've got to do something grandiose. <laughs> but just go back to what the scriptures say. It's so good. Oh, I, I love it. Um, scripture is a passion of mine. And I know that it's that's a pastor has to say that scripture is a passion. But it really, yeah, I love it. Well, I'm going to ask you very soon if there's a particular mm. scripture that is meaningful to you, but just hold that yeah. for a moment because right now you get to choose the music, at least one song. The brief is something that is meaningful to you right now or is really speaking to you or maybe it's an old favourite, but it's a song that you'd love to hear. So what have you chosen? Sure. Um, Highlands, Song of Ascent, and I think it's by Benjamin uh, Hastings and Hillsong United. Okay. I love that song. Okay, why? What is it about this song? This song just expresses such a commitment to praise God, not just in the happy and the good and the joyful moments, but it's also a commitment to praise God during our difficult our seasons and our challenging seasons and our hurtful and our painful seasons and recognizing that God is constant. His presence and his faithfulness is constant in every season of life, that God is still good, God is still present, and God is still active. And I love the line where it says that, no less God within the shadows and no less faithful when the night leads me astray. And it says, um, heaven is where my heart uh, is. Um, and it's like, you're the summit where my feet are. Mm. And it's like, it doesn't matter if it's on a mountaintop or a, a valley so low. If God's presence is there, that's where I want to be. Yeah, there's a wonderful story and pictures in this song. And it, it brings us right back to that place of doesn't matter what's going on. We need to praise God. Uh, Absolutely. Love it. So thank you for choosing this. It's one that we normally wouldn't play on a Sunday morning, so we get to hear something a little different. (laughs) Uh, It is from United Highlands Song of Ascent on Sunday morning together on Vision. Well, I wish I could bring you more than that in the podcast, but unfortunately due to copyright restrictions, I can't. 
But I'd encourage you to look it up. It's a really, really good song. Sunday Morning Together on Vision Christian Radio. I wonder if my next question to you might be a difficult one for somebody who has uh, and is very deeply passionate about systematic theology and Bible study. How do you pinpoint one favorite verse of Scripture or one life verse for you? Do you have one? I do, actually, and I would say it's Acts 1 verse 8 talks about when um, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, um, you will yeah, receive power and you will be witnesses for Jesus mm. um, from uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And it, I, I love it because it's this whole idea of encountering God for a purpose, and that purpose is to reach out. And it's not just reach out in Jerusalem where there was a idea that that's where God's presence was, that's where God's presence um, would stay and would dwell. It's going, actually, God's presence is going to go with you where you go Mm. and uh, taking it. And there's no limits to God's uh, uh, presence and and who God can reach. And we are actually empowered to do that. And that's exciting for me. So Acts 1 and verse 8. Wouldn't you love to have been there when when that (sighs) happened, you know? Yes. This is Sunday Morning Together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. And my guest co-host today is Pastor Shelley from the City Life Church in Melbourne. Big church, been around for a long time. But we want to talk about you this morning, Shelley, not so much the church. (laughs) Time to do a little bit of storytelling now to find out who is this person. Everybody's got a story and I often am amazed at some of the little gems that come along particularly of how God has been at work in the lives of people. I'm sure there's some of those for you. But let's start at the very, very beginning. I understand that you're a, a country girl. Is that right? Uh, I don't know if it's classified as the country, but it's called Emerald in Victoria, and it, it is actually pretty bush. It's where Puffing Billy is. So if you're in Melbourne and you know what Puffing Billy is, yeah, that the is a steam train. There. Well, it's almost. Yeah. Almost. Yes, and I could see Puffing Billy outside my bedroom window. So oh. grew up there. Yeah, grew up really poor, super poor. We had like gas bottles. We were not connected to the mains. Um, a, a truck we used to come along and empty our empty our sewerage. Our electricity was cut off all the time. Wow. Um, yeah, so hard times. But I guess that was a lot of people back in the early, like late eighties, early nineties in Emerald as well. So tank water before it was ev- environmentally friendly. <laughs> I mean, this sounds to me like you're going back into the nineteen forties or something. I in the in the nineteen eighties to still have you know the. The man, the can man, coming around to uh, yes. you know to empty that, things. That would have, yeah, that would have been um, even mid nineties. So, so that was right up until late for me, late primary school. Interesting, brothers mm-hmm. and sisters. Yeah, I do. I have a younger brother and a younger sister, and we're very close, very close family. Okay, so you're the oldest in the family. I am. Just give yes. me a little insight into what that's like, because I'm the youngest in in my family. How did that play out for you? Mm-hmm. Well, I'm definitely the dibba dobba. Um, <laughs> I think they usually say of the oldest child, a little bit of leadership, uh, you know, comes out. Leadership, bossy, I think they're synonymous there um, yep. when it comes to siblings. Yeah, yeah can be. So yeah. was there any faith in your household? Um, sort of. My dad grew up in a reformed church, but it was quite uh, – was quite religious, quite strict and traditional, and mm-hmm. he definitely rebelled against that. And when he met my mom, my mom, not a church background, and my dad was definitely not going to church. Um, and so I was born out of wedlock. Um, there was sort of a bit of addiction stuff going on in the family as well. Um, but my parents did come to know Jesus, I think, uh, when I was about, I'm going to say about five, between the ages of five and ten. Okay. And I remember them saying, oh, we're going to go to church now. And I thought that was the worst thing that could ever happen to me because it was so boring. <laughs> and they dragged was, you along and you had to they, put up with it? They did. Yeah. They did. And there was hardly anyone uh, my age at the very start. But the people from church became family. And still to this day, I call people auntie and uncle um, who are definitely not my auntie and uncle, but um, definitely very family orientated. Mm. Uh, it's a it's a reformed church, but everyone there, most of the people there in the 90s were Dutch. And so my dad has a Dutch heritage um, and uh, everyone actually is a little bit related. But even if you're not related, you still call them Martin. Mm. Uncle, so. yeah. And uh, look, I, I understand you say your dad is Dutch, but your mum from a very different culture. 
Yeah, she's half Japanese. And so we have a very Japanese culture um, um, running through our family. Even though I'm only a quarter Japanese, I kind of feel like I'm mostly Japanese, to be honest with you. Um, yeah, very strong upbringing uh, with Japanese culture. Mm, yeah. Interesting. So have you always lived in Victoria? I've always lived in Victoria and I've pretty much gone from a suburb called Emerald to a suburb called Narrywarren and Wonturna South. And that's, they're that's the ones that <laughs> No, it's not. So I've either worked in one, lived in one, or gone to church in one. And then they just rotate where I go to church, where I go to work, and where I live. Yeah. So it's uh yeah, just a triangle. It's, it's a great triangle though. So you you said your parents came to know uh, the Lord when you were around five years of age. You kind of reluctantly went along to church like this is boring, but you saw yeah. something in the people there. And obviously, something happened for you along the way. When did that happen? When did you yeah. have that awareness moment for yourself of God? Yeah. Well, I think it was a definitely a socialized faith until I was about 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and I actually visited another church in Emerald, and it was an Anglican church, and it had a fantastic youth and young adults community. Not that my um, uh -uh, there was anything wrong with my, my previous church, but there wasn't a lot of young people. Yeah. And when I visited this, uh, this church in Emerald, I reckon there would have been like 70 young people, and it just sort of went, wow, like this is – this is amazing. And I think that was that moment where I was like, I actually have to decide whether or not I'm going to believe this and live this for myself because it has to go from a socialized Christianity to a, uh, this is actually something that I'm going to personally believe and take on and I have to follow Jesus myself. Mm. And I just remember being in a church service and one of the girls gets up and goes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I was like, that's so weird. But I love it. <laughs> and I was like, me too. And so I think from 15 onwards, I was in church and not just in church. I was serving. I was reading my Bible. Um, I was just fully sold out. Mm. I mean, 15 is a pretty impressionable age. You're still trying to figure out who you are. Yeah. Um, were there people around you at the time that you can look back and go, they were you know, the ones that really invested into me heavily and walked the journey with me and helped me? Yeah, definitely. I would say my parents have been really big influences in my life, but the youth pastor at the time, she was a female and her name was Rhiannon. And I remember thinking, wow, she's a lady and she's awesome and she's a mum and she's so warm and I really want to be like her. And I remember going, I want to be a youth pastor when I grow up, not really knowing what I was saying. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I just remember thinking, that's that's amazing. And she was an incredible youth pastor and the community was great. So it was young people and peers all journeying and doing life together. But we had some really great leaders and mentors and pastors um, discipling us and, and journeying with us, which was really, really, really awesome, really well, helpful. Well, there's two things in what you just said. You, was, you want to be a youth pastor when you grow up. Now, mm. I know you're a youth pastor, but have you grown up? Yeah. Oh, definitely <laughs> not grown up yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's probably probably a good quality you need to be a youth pastor just to, to, to stay Definitely. youthful. Definitely. So you you went you've, since that time. So you're a youth pastor today. But as I look at your CV, there's some really interesting things on there that you went off and did a course of study and, and different things. How did you come to arrive at? I'm going to go in in this direction, particularly after you know praying that prayer of you know God, mm. I'd like to be a youth pastor, and you went and did something quite yeah. different. Yeah, so when I was 15, I was like, I want to be a youth pastor. And I was a, a youth leader at that time. And I was youth leading all the way through uh, high school, all the way through university. I, I wanted to go to Bible college. And so I wanted to study um, through more college in Sydney. I was doing a certificate for, mm -hmm. um, but they actually wouldn't let me in because I was 17 when I started uni. And they're like, you haven't turned 18 yet. And so I couldn't actually study via correspondence. And so um, my mom said, She's a high school teacher. She's like, you've got to get another degree before you go to Bible college. So I did science at Monash. Um, she just said, have it up your sleeve in case, you know, mm. um, which was good. I loved science. That's definitely a passion of mine. If I could live two lives, I would do that as well. Science um, is a pretty broad subject. Did you specialize <laughs> in something? Uh, yes, I have a double major in immunology and molecular and microbiology. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, just some light reading. If know? I get sick, I'll come and see you. <laughs> 
Well, it's interesting because that never used to come up in conversation. And then the pandemic happened and I was like, whoa, yeah. this is my area. Yeah. And then you're like, no, no, don't tell anyone that's your area. This is, you'll get canceled. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was interesting. It was good. But so you, you did do the Bible college study. You ended up becoming yes. a pastor um, eventually. How old were yes. you when you started in pastoral work? Um, so I think I was 20 when I started as an, wow. an, a paid intern, um, yeah. and that was in a young adults community. Um, and I was also running, helping run a schools ministry program, but I then did multiple roles. Like I did, um, I was a, a like admin, um, school, high schools worker. I wrote some mentoring programs. Um, I, I worked as a chaplain for a little bit. Um, I started, I think my full time pastoral role as a youth pastor full-time uh, in 2010 so that's about 14 years ago mm. um yeah but it's hard to get a full-time role it's really hard so you're doing a lot of the time you're doing multiple different roles a couple of days a week and i found that was quite t challenging to balance uh, i think at one time i was working like three maybe four jobs um, so landing an actual full-time role was really, really, was a blessing. Mm -hmm. But I had been studying theology since 2003, uh, part-time, um, all the way until 2021, I think, um, over, I think, three or four different awards. Yeah, three, maybe three awards, yeah. Mm. Sounds to me yeah. like you were really sort of throwing yourself into your, your work, shall we call it, your ministry work Yeah. Uh, in your young, you know, sort of low 20s. Mm. Were there any young men that came along, you know, in that time that d distracted you? Uh, there was actually. I wasn't. I wasn't super into heaps, heaps of different people. Like, I there was there was definitely one, and I um, actually got married uh, in 2010, and it was the year that I studied. Uh, sorry, the year that I started full time ministry as a vocation. Okay, and so a lot of change. My life just, yeah, a lot of change, but it just felt like life was life was good. I mean, there's always ups and downs, um, but I just felt like in my early 20s, it's like you're invincible. Like, no, like this is amazing. Life is good. And life is good. Life is incredible. I think the more that the, the older I get, the more that I, I can say life is, is good, but it's not without its major challenges. And um, my husband and, and I at the time, we were trying to have kids and there we just couldn't have kids mm. it would have been maybe three four five years um and we ended up going down the fertility uh, treatment uh, route and still not being able to have kids and it was really devastating because we do go to a large church and a lot of people keep asking when are you gonna have kids when are you gonna have kids yeah. and it was hard because um you know we'll pray for you and people are like you know i really see kids in your future and you're like oh like how do i tell them i Medically, this is you know, God can do anything, but it just wasn't happening. Yeah. And um, in my seventh year of marriage, my husband actually walked out of our marriage. Oh no! And so, I was divorced by twenty. I think it's twenty seventeen or twenty eighteen. Um, no, yeah, yeah, 2017, 2018. Um, and that was huge because I remember thinking, how did my life come to this? Because I'm a pastor, like. I've given my whole life to God and I've sacrificed so much stuff and yet, you know, it just seemed to have all fell apart. I mean, no one's perfect, but, you know, I, I felt like I, I try really hard yeah. and it's still, you know, um, God, where are you in all this? And so there was this incredible journey of going, hey, um, I, I love God and I love my job and I feel called to do what I what I what I'm doing, but how do you walk that season um, so publicly with the whole church looking at you yeah, while you're I'm, still maintaining integrity? I'm trying to put um, myself into yeah. your shoes because you know here you are, everybody's looking at you. You're in a leadership position, and this is something mm. that shouldn't happen to people in leadership. And you would have mm. a whole range of responses to that. I imagine some people probably wanting to support you, and other people that that are there pointing their finger. How did you? Oh, how did yeah. you deal with that? It was a really, uh, really difficult because, but because I do have a science background, I used to always think of things in a bell curve. I'm like, okay, 
if this many people said a really silly comment to me about there was this many people who attended the church service, and then I think about that, that's two more than two standard deviations away from the mean, <laughs> which, and I think about it statistically. I'm like, don't worry about that. Yeah. You can just like get rid of that data. That's like, that's like, that's an outlier. <laughs> yeah. And so that's funny. I would, yeah. So my rational brain goes there, but it was difficult when you're really upset. And sometimes you can't show that because there's a difference between um, being authentic to people, but also not bleeding on people at the same time. And yeah. so I'm happy to talk about my struggles, um, but as long as there's a level of healing that has happened, so there isn't that bleeding. Because you also don't want to ever use your platform to bag somebody else or to put somebody else down as well. So I do have to preface that um, um, there's been so much healing with uh, what happened with my divorce. There is um no hard feelings and there's there's no um um things that i feel like are, are left undone which is i by the grace of god by the way mm. um um that forgiveness journey is a big one and it's a long one sometimes but i think by the sixth sixth year um god had just completely put balm over it and i can't explain to you how but no anger no bitterness um yeah just the grace of god really mm. It's uh, it's interesting. The scriptures talk about divorce, and you know that God hates divorce, but mm. He doesn't hate the people. Did yes. you have to? Did you have a difficulty separating those two ideas at all in your journey? It was a hard one because, as a pastor, you're like, God loves everybody, and He loves everybody equally. You know, and sometimes you're like, but that's not fair because God should love me more because I'm doing the right thing. <laughs> But it's not. It's going, no, he loves that person just as much as he loves you. And even though you want to slag them off or you want to bag them or whatever, God doesn't want to do that. God's not doing that. And so having to then pull yourself up and the grace of God becomes real then. Because you also think to yourself, if I ever stuff up or if I'm ever in a position where I need to be shown grace, I hope and I know that God would do the same thing for me, and I'd hope that others would do the same thing for me as well, show people grace. Yeah. So, yeah. So um, when I talk about this, sometimes in hindsight, because people saw it publicly, they thought, wow, she did such a perfect job at, you know, walking this journey. But can I just say, behind the scenes was very messy. Mm. There was times where I couldn't get out of bed, and I was living back with my mum and dad, and my dad would have to pull the blinds up in the morning because – I needed light and he would make me a cup of tea and and they would support me heaps. And so sometimes I don't want to I don't want to come across from just this platform ministry where everything looks great because it's like social media. You show the best but you hide the rest. Struggles are real, but the grace of God is also there mm-hmm. and God's presence is there. Yeah. And the season won't last forever. So let's fast forward a little bit further now. Yeah. How long ago was uh, was all of that happening, and uh, and what mm. is life for you like today? Yeah, I think it was about six or seven years ago um, that all happened. Um, fast forward, and I only got married, remarried a couple of weeks ago, uh, 3rd of September, which oh. was really good, in the Nevada desert. Oh, um, it was wow. only 42 degrees and no, no shade, so it was very smart and wise, but it was cheap. <laughs> <laughs> 42 degrees, that's still pretty hot. I mean, you're talking it, Celsius, yeah. right? I'm talking Celsius. Okay. It was very, very hot, but yeah. it was cheap, and uh, it was like a mini elopement, which is beautiful. Okay. Uh, yes, All right. Yes. The Nevada but, Desert. Not everybody does that. So <laughs> Interesting. And, but but I, I believe children have actually come into your life a, as part of that. Yes. So I now have our two stepsons. They are seven and four. Um, and it's it's funny because – That whole journey of six or seven years of going through a very public divorce, having a lot of different opinions, people talking about, oh, like Job, God's going to restore you double, all this kind of stuff. And I actually actually don't think that that is a promise. I know that's a bit controversial, but God doesn't promise you a perfect life. He promises you that he's going to be present, Mm. um, but but I I don't expect that. And I actually have a really big philosophy about um, suffering being a big part of a discipleship and your journey. And so I'm actually okay to sit with the negative feelings. Um, and so when I, uh, I found my, my, my husband 
um, and people were like, yes, you have kids now. And um, because I'm still probably not able to have kids, I'm nearly 40 and I died medically, I don't think so. And um, people were like, this is amazing. This is God's restoration. Um, and it is, it's fantastic. But with that still comes such levels of um, uh, messiness and, and mm. difficulty as well. And sometimes from the outside, it can look like everything's perfect, but it's sometimes it, it's just another mountain to climb. But through the times in my past where um, I've had difficulties, um, God has strengthened me. God has built in me resilience. And so when the next mountain comes along, I'm actually stronger. And I know that God is with me. And I know that um, um doesn't matter what gets thrown my way, um, whether it's, you know, God will restore, whether it's this side of eternity or not, um, um, that's actually okay. And so I'm all right to walk through whatever struggle I'm walking through. And hopefully I am being a, a, a role model to other people who are struggling to say, hey, life just throws curveballs at you. Mm. But to stand firm and to stand strong and say, God is still good. God is still faithful and I'm going to praise him no matter what season I'm going through. What would you say to someone who perhaps is feeling, my life is too messy for God to use me? Oh, no, not at all. Um, God can use anybody. I think about Numbers 22, God used a dog donkey to speak through and I'm pretty sure that anyone listening is at least half a step up from a donkey I think I'm about <laughs> half a step from up from a donkey I hope so. so if God can use me he can use absolutely anybody but I also think that um it, it's through uh, Paul talks about this it's, it's through um you know our weaknesses that God's power is demonstrated yeah and God can use anybody as long as you're willing um and able and we're living in a world that wants authenticity um and they want to know um, um not just you know show the best, hide the rest. They want to know those, you know, struggles um, and and how to navigate that in, in a real and an authentic way. And so I think the world is waiting to hear Christians talk about this sort of stuff. Yeah. See that we're real. We're actually Absolutely. We actually do have mess that we have to walk through, but we've got someone who mm. walks with us and, uh, yes. and helps us. Uh, God is there with us in the storm. I'm really encouraged. Absolutely. Courage to hear your story, Shelley. So thank you so much thank for you. sharing it this morning. We'll uh, draw a line there, and I'll let you get ready for the best five-minute sermon that we're going to hear today. So five minutes for a start might be a challenge. What's it, what's it going to be on? Um, it's actually, I would love to talk about um, suffering as a big part of discipleship in okay. the Gospel of Mark. This is Sunday Morning Together across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. But you're yes. going to talk about something I don't know you often hear Pentecostal pastors talking about, and that is suffering. It's yes. The message of, the, the, that, that's the, uh, the subject of the best five minute sermon that you'll hear today. So I'm intrigued. Let's start the clock and get going. It's over to you. Thank you. Well, earlier this year, a guest speaker at our church shared an illustration about stones in a rushing riverbed, and he explained how the constant flow of water smooths out the rough edges of those stones over time. And this process, though, is far from easy. And I remember at the start of the year in that moment, I remember praying a commitment prayer to God to say, God, I want to be one of those stones. I want to get in the riverbank. I want you to smooth out my rough edges. I prayed that God would refine me so I could be more like him. But, but what I wasn't prepared for was just how hard that process would be. You know, sometimes when not fully ready for the struggles that come with following Jesus, even when we know and even when we expect it to be tough. And maybe you felt the same way. And maybe you've thought following Jesus would mean all your problems would be solved, that there would be no more struggles or no more setbacks. Maybe you've prayed for a healing and it didn't happen. Or maybe you've prayed to get a job, but it went to somebody else. Or maybe you've been well prepared for difficulties, but when they came along, they hit harder than you expected. Suddenly, sometimes life just doesn't seem to match up with what we think faith in Jesus would bring. If that's you today, I just want to say you're not alone. Even Jesus' disciples misunderstood what following him meant. They thought that being Jesus' disciples meant miracles and success and victory. 
But in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 8, Jesus redefines discipleship and what it looks like to follow him. Jesus starts talking about suffering, saying that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, and be killed. And his disciple Peter rebukes him because the idea of suffering just didn't fit with his expectations of the Messiah. But Jesus makes it clear, following him isn't just about the high points. It's about walking through suffering too. And if we look at the Gospel of Mark as a whole, we can actually trace this journey of suffering and discipleship geographically. The story of Jesus' ministry in the Gospel of Mark begins in Galilee. And this region is portrayed in this particular gospel as being marked by great miracles and displays of Jesus' power. He's healing the sick. He's casting out demons, feeding the 5,000. Life is good. They were in Galilee, a place of action and success where everything seemed to be great. Everything seems hopeful and victorious in Galilee. But chapter 8, we reach this pivotal moment. Jesus and his disciples move geographically to Caesarea Philippi. And in Mark 8, verse 34, Jesus says, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. The disciples had seen great miracles in Galilee, but Jesus calls them to follow him to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem in this gospel is portrayed as a place of suffering, of opposition, of hardship. And here's that, uh, uh, and there's a reality of following Jesus. The reality is becoming clear. Discipleship isn't just about witnessing miracles and enjoying the good times. It's about walking with Jesus through the suffering journey. And maybe you've experienced a Galilee season where everything is going well, but maybe you find yourself right now in a Jerusalem season, struggling, maybe with an illness or a loss or even mental health challenges. Moments like these are incredibly difficult, but it's also in moments like these that we have the opportunity to be refined. As Romans 5, 3 to 5 says, Paul says this, he says, we also glory in our suffering because suffering produces perseverance, perseverance character and character hope. God doesn't waste our pain. He uses it to strengthen us, to refine us like gold in the fire. You know, when gold is refined, it is heated to extremely high temperatures until it melts. And at this point, the impurities or the the other metals that are mixed with the gold actually rise to the surface and they are removed, leaving behind pure gold. You see, gold in its purest form is soft, which allows it to be shaped and molded easily. And when we go through trials and challenges, God allows our impurities in our hearts, things like anger, pride, fear to surface. And these moments of struggle are opportunities for us to let God purify and shape us as these things rise to the surface. We can ask God to refine our characters so we become more like him, soft and moldable in his hands. The journey of discipleship through suffering leads to hope. Just as Jesus told Peter in Mark chapter 14, verse 28, Jesus says, after I have risen, I will go ahead of you uh, ahead of you to, Ga- to Galilee. You see, Jesus promises to bring Peter back to the place of restoration, the place um, of, of power, the place of Galilee. And he walks with us through the hard times, but he also leads us back to a place of healing and a place of power. Whether it's this side of eternity or not, God is always faithful. And as we close, I just want to invite you to respond today. If you are in need of hope, please know that your Galilee is coming. Like Peter's discipleship journey, there is an opportunity to strengthen and to grow. Or if you're in a Jerusalem season and need strength to carry your cross, remember that you are not alone. Jesus is with you. And we would love to be able to pray with you right now. If that's you, I'd love to just be able to pray with you. Dear God, we thank you so much that you give us life. We pray for those, God, who need strength in Jerusalem seasons. We thank you for all kinds of seasons, and we thank you for your presence. But we also pray for your peace that transcends all understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Sunday Morning Together 
Across Australia on Vision Christian Radio. Shelley, now obviously you're the youth pastor there at City Life in Melbourne. It's a pretty big church in Melbourne, but you get around a bit and do other things as well. Just looking at, you've got a website here, ShellySuzanneMinistries.com. And yes. I'm guessing that must be your middle name, is it, Suzanne? Yes, it is. Yes, yeah. it is. So, um, yeah, I just, I go by that just so, I don't know, in case I got married in the future and changed my last name again, I would, you know, have, have that portability. Have to change my website. That's exactly right. <laughs> but you, you get around, you are uh, you know, preaching mm. and teaching, doing seminars and, and so on. Mm-hmm. What What's your favorite experience out of all of that? What do you really, really love doing? I think I really like the um, uh, equipping and, and training uh, element. Um, it's it's one thing to have just head knowledge and a great God experience, like, wow, that was a really good sermon. Oh, that was great. That encouraged me. And I, I, I'm not taking away from that. But to be able to train and equip people um, so when you do actually leave, there's, you know, you've given them some tools uh, to be able to either replicate that or to be able to um, um, give them tools to be able to um, I don't know, build on their youth ministry or their church or some element of teaching. Um, I do a lot of things with mental health and also Gen Z um, and spiritual formation um, and lots of different Bible uh, teaching stuff. And so there's different areas, but the training and equipping part is my favorite. Mm. Yeah, Hands-on ministry training. It's always great to help people and see them actually grow themselves. Yeah. I mean, you work yeah. a lot with young people. You just mentioned Gen Z. What do you reckon is the kind of the biggest challenge that young people are facing today? And then also, mm. what's the biggest potential that is waiting there to be released? Yeah. Well, I think the biggest challenge they're facing at the moment is definitely mental health. There's mental health struggles um, and challenges. And so having advocacy and safe places for people to be able to be real and authentic and to be able to support them um is really is really massive. So my church is. I'm really proud that our church has done a lot in this area. Um, there's a lot of work to continue to be done in my church as well. Um, but we're at that level where we're now sort of helping train other churches and equip other churches, and that again is just exciting as well. And that's not to say we've got it all together. There's a lot of work to be done, and we could do things better. But I think it's it's seeing young people um, equipped and feeling safe in churches, especially if this is the biggest thing plaguing them. Yeah. But there's an incredible opportunity because Gen Z is so open. Um, World Vision and Barna did some research uh, just last year or the year before, and they were talking about, and they named it the open generation. And although they might, this generation, Gen, Gen uh, Z, they might not um, identify with a religion. They are spiritually open and they are hungry. The harvest is ready. Um, and yeah, it, it's ripe and it's, it's people want to connect. But um, yeah, so it's, it's an exciting season. And I guess if there are people that are interested in, like, I want to do something, I want to work with somebody who's in this space, you'd be a good one to talk to. Oh, I, I love it. I'll talk your ear off about it. <laughs> I'm very passionate. <laughs> well, Shelley Suzanne Ministries, S-H-E-L-L-E-Y-S-U-S-A-N-N-E Ministries.com. You have to have two names there. It could be spelled different ways. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but uh, that's the website. I'm sure if you just search for uh, Shelley Suzanne Ministries, it'll come up with the right thing. But um, um, I'm sure Shelley would love to talk to you. Now, I wonder as we finish things off here this morning, whether you might be willing to lead us in a prayer for our nation and and perhaps perhaps particularly for young people. We've talked about some of the challenges that uh, young people are facing, but lots of people in our nation facing challenges, lots of things to celebrate as well. So uh, can you lead us? Yeah, I'd love to. Thank you. Dear God, we thank you uh, for just the opportunity to know you and to get to know you. And God, we thank you so much that you are not a God who is far away, but you are a God who is present. And God, we just pray that we're able to uh, fully grasp that and that we will acknowledge your presence every single day, that you will continue to empower us and lead us by your spirit. God, open doors of opportunity for us to be able to reach our communities and our cities and our nation, Lord Jesus, for you. And God, I just pray um, just a, a blessing on our nation. I just pray a blessing on our uh, next generations, on Gen Z, on Gen Alpha. God, I just pray for us as older generations um, to be able to have wisdom and discernment as to how to reach them. God, we know that you don't change. Your message doesn't change, but our methods and and how we uh, uh, communicate does. And God, we just pray for wisdom and discernment and how to do that and how to just continue to point people to who you are. God, we just pray um, that um, we'll be able to be 
good reflectors of your love and your mercy and your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm, Amen. Great prayer. Well, thank you once again, Shelley, for spending some time thank with you. us. Just uh, we pray a blessing over you, your uh, your new marriage. Only now of what three weeks thank was you. it? Uh, yeah, it's, it's and uh, in your in your work you're doing there at City Life Church in Melbourne. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. And God bless you too as you go about your day, whatever you're up to. Have a great day. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.